Hello and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. And I am your host, Paul Markle. And of course, across the table from me, behind his very own black carbon steel microphone, is Jared. Hello, Jared. Hi, how are you doing today? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm doing fantastic. And uh, we're uh, again at our home studio in Biloxi, Mississippi, and the mercury is rising down here on the Gulf Coast. But that's okay, because we're in the air conditioning. Isn't that right, Jared? Yes, I love to be in the air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's not forget about our good friends at Keltech Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. You can always check them out at keltechweapons.com. And we've got a special treat for you guys this week. I actually just talked to uh, my good buddies up at Crossbreed Holsters in Republic, Missouri. And we decided that what we're going to do is we're going to do a five-week-long Crossbreed Holster giveaway. That's right. We're going to give away one Super Tuck holster per week for five weeks. And all you have to do to be eligible is go to studentofthegun.com. And over on the right-hand side of the page there, or on the home page, there's a little sign-up. And you're like, oh, what are you going to what are you going to sell me or what are you going to charge me? Dudes, we're not going to sell you anything. We're not going to charge you anything. We don't sell your... We don't sell your addresses to anybody. All that does, that's uh, for our, our regular newsletter. And if you sign up, you find out every week, you get to find out what's new on the show, what's new on the radio, what uh, new articles we've got going, if we've got any new cool products or DVDs or anything like that. And if you are an active subscriber, that's where we pick the winners for all of our giveaway contests is from the active subscriber list. So all you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com sign up and uh what all uh, and once you what we'll do is each week uh we're going to give everybody a week to sign up so when you hear this if you hit, listen to this on monday you've got until the next monday it'll be monday june 17th when this airs okay so this is this episode is going to originally air on the 17th we'll give you another week so from this point forward for five weeks we're going to come to the microphone and we're going to give you a winner each and every week. Now, you're good. what you're going to get is you're going to get a free Super Tuck holster of your choice. If you like the Glock, the Smith, the whatever, 1911, you can pick it. So it's really simple, it's really easy, and it's really free. All you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com, sign up, and you could be eligible to win. You will be eligible to win a Super Tuck holster from Crossbreed. Now, Jared, why don't you go ahead and we can't stop giving away free stuff. Well, that's, that's what we do. We just give away free stuff. And as you guys know, if we pick your question as the student of the week, then you'll get a free, an official student of the gun t-shirt. Now, Jared's going to tell us who our student of the week is this week. Our student of the week is Tim Kirstein. And, uh, he's tired of hearing about how you, how to take care of your gun. He wants to know what to do with the magazines. Uh, his question is what kind of maintenance can be done to the magazines? Does the spring need to be replaced? What's the time period the magazines can be loaded before you have to let the spring relax? Or do you even have to do that? And what's the lifespan of the magazine spring? Okay, Tim, that's a really good question. And uh, that gave me the opportunity. It's it's funny that, that uh, you sent that question in because uh, this week I was dealing with other uh, spring-related questions about the uh, firing pin springs and hammer springs and so forth. And so what I did is I conducted a little bit of a research project. I called the folks at Wolf Gun Springs and at the folks at Damage USA. Now, Damage USA, they make lots of parts for ARs and AKs, and they make a ton of springs. Now, <laughs> like any any other topic of debate, whether it's ammunition or whether it's caliber or whether it's action, depending on who you talk to, you're going to get different answers because people have their own, you know, their, their own, not, not just agendas, but their own personal experience. Now, if you talk to somebody that makes springs for a living, if their job is to make springs and you say, how often should I replace my springs? Well, they're probably going to tell you, very often because they sell you springs <laughs> or magazines or what have you. But here's what I found out. Number one, when we're talking about springs, there's lots of different types of springs on firearms and in magazines. But generally what you're talking about is a coil spring of some sort. Now, a coil spring can be made of music wire, of stainless steel, of chrome silicon. There's lots of different materials out there. And when I was talking to the folks at Wolf and then I was talking to Ken Robinson at Damage USA, what they essentially said and what Ken, uh, one of the things Ken said is when we talk about lifespan 
of springs, it's measured in years. And, you know, how many years can we get out of it? And he said, the truth is, yeah, with average use, you should get 10, 20, 30 years of life out of your springs in your magazines and in your firearms. It just depends on how much you use them and how much stress you put them under. So think about it like that. If you use uh, your magazines, if you take them to the range once a month, load them, unload them, you should get years worth of uh, service life out of them. Now, also keep in mind, there are lots of different types of spring material. And depending on you know who you are and and what in, and experience and information you have you might prefer a chrome silicon spring which is a flat spring uh i everybody i talked to said that stainless steel everybody when you hear stainless steel you think oh that's got to be best they said actually stainless steel isn't the preferable uh material to use for gun springs it's either music wire or chrome silicon so that's something to think about but to your question to your question is how often should i replace my magazine springs well I suppose it's uh, the good question is how often are you going to use them? And people have said, well, if you, if you download them two or three rounds, then that increases the life of your spring. Okay. I've also had people that make springs tell me it, it makes no difference whatsoever whether you download them, that it's, it is what it is. And, and one of the manufacturers told me this. They said, look, when you compress a spring, it's in, it's not moving. It's sitting there waiting for its energy to be released. And, uh, well, actually it was, it was Ken that I talked to and he said, he goes, I've, I've had GI magazines, GI M16 magazines that were loaded and staged and had been staged a, at the ready for 20 years. We pulled them out. We shot them. Every one of them worked fine. He said, we've also had AK magazines. I found AK magazines in the Soviet bloc countries that were loaded, staged. And he said, and they were a disaster. The, the springs failed. And he said, well, one of the reasons is because the amount uh, or the quality of the spring that goes into it. Think about it like this. If you buy cheap magazines, if you buy the, the cheap magazine, the cheapest magazine you can find, well, why did you buy it? Oh, it's a bargain, dude. It was the cheapest one I could find. Okay. How does a company sell you an inexpensive magazine? They're able to sell you an inexpensive magazine because they put the most inexpensive components that they can find into that magazine. Now, when it comes to protecting your own life or saving your own life, do you want the gun on your hip or the gun on your nightstand to be loaded with the cheapest magazine you can find or do you want it to be loaded with a quality magazine? Because let's face it, as, as good as that pistol is, if the magazine fails, it's nothing more than a paperweight. So spend the money on quality gear. The big thing that uh, an, another point that uh, they made to me is that changing springs is one of the cheapest and easiest things you can do to a firearm or a magazine. You know, if you're really concerned, if you say, well, you know, I've had this pistol and the magazines, I've had them all for, you know, five, six years now, I use them a lot. And you're really, and you're, you know, genuinely concerned that, hey, the, the springs might be getting worn out, just replace them. They're not that expensive. And it's one of the cheapest things you can do to a firearm or the least expensive things to do to a firearm to keep it running properly. So if you really have concerns with your uh, magazines, you know, you just change out the springs. But I can tell you that from a personal standpoint, I've had magazines, pistol magazines, duty magazines that were loaded for years literally years, and shot just fine. But they were high quality. They came from reputable manufacturers. So if you buy cheap, you're going to get cheap. If you buy quality, you're going to get quality. And if you're really concerned that, hey, these springs springs might be getting old and they might be wearing out, just get online and, and buy some new ones and replace them. It's one of the, the least expensive and easiest things you can do to keep your guns running right. So. Let's talk about gun control. And you're, you guys out there are cringing, aren't you? You're all cringing. You're like, oh, I don't want to talk about gun control. No, gun control. Uh, we've been told that by, Com I believe it was a quote from Comrade Barry, that if, if this law can save one child's life, then it's worth it. If we can save only one child, then this law is worth it. It is worth taking away your rights if we can save the life of one child. Now, if we believe 
that side of the uh, of the aisle and if we believe that they're actually that they want to save children that is that is their greatest concern is the saving the lives of children then what we need to do is we need to consider what are the things that harm children or what actions uh what circumstances uh cause accidental deaths now we're not talking about deliberate deaths deliberate deaths are a whole nother story but accidental deaths in children now, if you go to the Center for Disease Control, cdc.gov, and we'll put the link up for you, you'll find that in the United States of America, the top 10 items or top 10 reasons that children die accidentally are burns, drowning, falls, poisoning, and car crashes. That's right. Uh, Firearms-related accidental deaths are very, very far down on the list. But the the top five causes of accidental death in children are burns, drowning, falling, poisoning, and car crashes. Now, think about that. If our greatest concern, you know, the gun control debate, the gun control people, the ones who think that you don't need to have that, you don't need that gun, you should get permission before you're allowed to have one. Okay. If they really, really, really wanted to save children's lives, wouldn't they concern themselves with the top five? What do you mean? Well, let's think about it like this. If, if guns are the reason we, you know, banning guns and prohibiting people from having guns, that's what we're going to do to save children's lives. Shouldn't we prohibit children from riding in cars? Don't let them ride in cars until they're age 16. Well, that's dumb, Paul. You can't do that. People have to be able to do that. Yeah, but don't we know that that's one of the top five reasons, uh, uh, injuries that kill children is car crashes? Well, yeah, but, but we have to have that. Oh, oh, okay. How about burns? Think about it. Burns, drowning, falls, poisoning, and car crashes. I would venture to say that pretty much every household in the United States of America has a stove and a heater. They have water. Do you have water in your house? You have uh, gravity. Is there gravity in your house at some point? How about chemicals? Bleach, uh, laundry detergent, so forth. Car crashes. Do you have a car? Do your children go in in and out of cars? Well, why don't we ban all those things? Let's ban fire, water, gravity, liquid bleach, cars. We'll ban all of those things and we'll keep our children safe. Well, if you ex- take look a little bit deeper into the uh, surveys, you'll find that... Um, since, and this goes back to, this is a CBS News report I'm quoting right here, but it's uh, information from the CDC again. It says, since the year 2000, accidental deaths in children are down by 30%. That's right. That is a huge amount. When you, when you factor in, you know, over decades and decades, you know, a 1% or 2% change is, is, is pretty significant. But since the year 2000, we've actually done a much better job as a society protecting our children from accidental deaths. That's down 30%. That is a huge amount. And I bet you that if you're listening to the sound of my voice right now, there's a really good chance that you didn't know that. Because if you read, well, I was saying, nobody reads the newspaper anymore, but if you read the internet uh, or if you get online, you would think or watch the evening news that right now more children in America are dying than ever before. You'd think that we were in a crisis situation and the government has to do something to save the children. We, we just have to give the government more power to save our children. When really the fact is, is accidental deaths in children are down by 30%. That's a huge deal. Now, what's funny is, uh, and this is the, so- the society that we live in, is in the story, it says that deaths are down, accidental deaths in children are down by 30%, but we can do more. We can do better. So, I, I suppose we're not supposed to, you know, take heart. We're not supposed to accept that and think, oh, that's a good thing. We're supposed to say, oh, well, yeah, that's good, but we can do better. So we, we have to, we still have to put a little bit of crisis spin on it to, to make us not, uh, you know, and, and you have to ask yourself, why is that? Why is it that, number one, we don't promote that, that good news that accidental deaths in children are down 30%. And then why do you have to throw that little tag in there? But but we can do more. We can do better. Does that mean that we need to give up more of our rights to the government so that they can keep us safe? 
I don't know. You answer that question yourself. Now, if you're talking to your your anti-gun colleagues or people at work or people you just run into uh, and they and they fall back on the whole, well, we have to have more gun control for the children. If you don't accept more government gun control and more restrictions on your liberty, then you don't love children. You want children to die. Why do you want children to die? If you would just be reasonable and give more control to the government, then more children would be saved. And uh, now those same people really don't like facts because if you ask them what is the leading cause of death and accidental death in children, well, they're not going to tell you that it's burns and falls and poisoning and car crashes that, because that doesn't fit their narrative. The narrative, and what I found was I was conducting research for this week's show, is if you put in accidental death or children accidental death or you Google search it, what you find is a whole bunch of information, and somewhere in there it says firearms death or gun deaths or, or you know, so forth, even though statistically they can't come up with enough, you know, instances to make it a high statistic. I, I'll give you a good example. I was on one website, and it had the uh, the causes of accidental death from children. It had them listed, you know, highest to lowest, and it was burns and falls and so forth. And about halfway, three-quarters of the way down the page was the word uh, firearms accidents, right? Well, of all of the causes of deaths that were listed on that page, the only one that was in bold was the word firearms accidents. Even though it was at the bottom of the list, they felt the need to put it in bold. Why do you suppose that is? Let's be honest with ourselves. Why do you suppose that it is that they felt the need to put it in bold? Well, because that supports their agenda. That supports the the narrative that guns are bad and we need to get rid of guns for the children. Because if you don't favor getting rid of guns, if you don't favor greater restrictions, then obviously you don't like children and shame on you. Now I've got one. This is this is one that you can throw uh, on your anti-gun. We have to save the children. People say, "All right, um, I just agree with them when they come up and they say to you, we you know we we need to support this gun ban legislation. We have to do it to save our children." And you you say to them, "You know what? You are absolutely right. Anything we can do to save one child's life is worth it." And they're going to look at you kind of strange and be like, hmm, I thought this this guy, I thought this lady was pro-gun. But, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll play along with them. They'll say, oh, you're, yeah, you're right. You're right. And children's and, – and go even farther. Say, say the life of every child is precious, and that precious life must be defended at all costs. And if they're still on the, if they haven't wised up yet, they're like, oh, you're, you're correct. You're correct. And what, that's why we need immediate, immediate legislation to ban these assault weapons and to limit these magazine and clip capacities. And you're, you're like, yep. Yeah. So just say, and I think what we need to do is we need to immediately outlaw all abortions. <laughs> you were with them. And then they ran into the wall. They're like, whoa, 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 stop. No, no, no. That's I'm not saying that. You're like, well, hold on, Sparky. You just agreed with me. You just said that the life of every child is precious and every child's life must be preserved and protected. And whatever we can do to save a child's life, we have to do it. So why do you think that children who are still inside their mother's womb should be killed. Oh, oh, that's not the same thing. That's a red herring. Oh, no way to change the subject, buddy. That's not the same thing. Really? So if the infant is two days old and it gets shot to death with a gun, we need to ban everyone's guns because that's how we save children. So if it's a toddler and it gets killed in a drive-by shooting by a gangbanger, instead of saying we need to do something about these gangs, what we say is we need to do something about all this gun violence. But if the child is in its mother's womb and it's four and a half months old, then it's okay to go in and kill it, throw it in a garbage can, and move on with our lives. Is that what you're saying? Oh, that's that's reproductive rights, and that's a woman's choice, and da 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 You can't have it both ways, folks. Sorry. Sorry, liberal hypocrites, 
You cannot have it both ways. You can't tell me that I need to give up all of my guns and I need to have them registered and I need to get permission from the government because that will save one child's life. And then at the same time, tell me that a child that is inside its mother's womb isn't really a child. Ask, you know, <laughs> and they, oh, they get mad. They get mad when you do that. They, oh, we're going to change the subject. How is that changing the subject? Tell me when a child becomes a child. Tell me when a child's life is valuable and when it is not valuable. It, when it's still inside the mother's womb, it's not valuable. But then when it's out of the womb, it is valuable. Is that how it works now? Uh, did you know that last year, ask them, say, did you know that last year Planned Parenthood conducted 333,000 abortions? That's right. Uh, by their own annual report. Uh, and this isn't just something that was made up by the pro-life co- coalition. By their own report, they conducted 333,000 and change abortions in 2012. And so according to Comrade Barry, if we can pass legislation that will save the life of one child, it's worth it. It's worth doing. We need to do it. Well, what if we could pass legislation that would save 300,000 children's lives a year? What if we could do that? Would that legislation be worth it? And ask if you really want to hack off your your friends, your your liberal uh, anti gun friends. Just ask them. Say if we could pass a law that would save three hundred thousand children's lives every year. Do you think we should pass that law? And uh, depending on where their mind is at the moment, they might say, "Yeah." Say, "Well, why don't we make abortion illegal?" <gasps> you can't do that. That's a woman's choice. That's reproductive rights. Oh, so you have a choice to have an abortion or not, but I don't have a choice to have that evil, mean, nasty black rifle because I can't be trusted with it. Okay, just checking. So, uh, when it, you know, <laughs> arm yourself with the facts, ladies and gentlemen. If you are a pro Second Amendment person, if you are a pro gun person, and you are confronted by your friends, coworkers, neighbors, whatever, that will tell you that we need more gun control. We need greater restrictions for the children. Say, you know what? You're absolutely right. And let's go ahead and consider that for a second. And then you can take the information that we've talked about this week and you can throw it right back in their faces and see what they think. And and you know, we know that liberals hate logic. Liberals don't like logic. Liberals are ruled by emotion. Oh, we've got a follow-up. Let's talk about our follow-up. Uh, we follow-up from last week. Last week we talked about how the... Uh, the citizens of the state of Colorado recalled they successfully got enough signatures to uh, force a recall of the Colorado State Senate president, John Morris. Well, before we could even put that uh, that episode to bed, we got more information that uh, the citizens of Colorado had done it again. They actually came up with enough signatures to recall Angela Giron, G-I-R-O-N, not sure how you pronounce that, but they uh, came up with, they needed, how many do they need? They needed 11,000 or something like that, but they have successfully got enough signatures to recall another anti-gun uh, Senator, this is one of the ones that uh, basically said, we really don't care what the citizens have to say. We're just going to do it anyway because it's important. And so that's two in Colorado that they've recalled, or at least that they've got enough signatures. Now, keep a close eye on the situation, freedom-loving people of the United States of America. Even if you don't live in the state of Colorado or anywhere near it, you want to keep a close eye on this because once they certify that those signatures are from legitimate voters are from registered voters in the appropriate district and that the signatures are good. Once they do that, we have to find out. We'll say, will John Moore step down? Will this uh, Angela Giron, will she step down? And if they refuse to step down, what is the next recourse? Now, I can't imagine them refusing. I imagine that their party will probably come up to them and say, hey, just go ahead and step down. And then when everybody's not paying attention, we'll give you a really cool government job. That's usually how it works. So if you want to pay attention, uh, if you want to uh, know what's going on out there, we'll put the links up for you guys so you can uh, follow them. But keep a close eye on these on these worms, on these vermin. And that is, hey, I don't need, think I need to tell you, but I'm going to remind you that that's usually exactly what happens with government employees. They get in trouble. They make a big deal out of punishing them in the public, in the news. And then a year later, 
they give them a really cushy government job somewhere. They get payback. So you want to pay attention, find out, make sure that these uh, that these people who are violating the trust of the American voters, of the Colorado voters, these people who have violated that trust, who instead of being public servants are acting like rulers and kings. So uh, keep an eye out for that. So we'll put that up for you. So uh, Colorado voters have done it again. The second Colorado state senator has been recalled. Now, don't forget about this week on Student of the Gun television. If you're not watching Student of the T- Gun TV, I don't know why. It's free. It's easy. You can, If you're listening to me on some type of mobile device, which I know you are, you're either listening to me on your laptop, on your desktop, on your iPhone, on your smartphone, whatever, uh, you can watch Student of the Gun TV just by going to studentofthegun.com. We put the new shows up every Tuesday. Just click the play button, sit there, relax, and watch it. So uh, don't don't forget that. What's up this week, Jared? Right now we had our the birthday bash. That's right. The birthday bash is up right now. We got the four step draw stroke, and uh, we checked out a really cool carbine. Uh, now I don't know if it's carbine. It's a, a seven six two by thirty nine Czechoslovakian army rifle, the VZ two zero zero eight. If you want to check out the VZ twenty zero eight, you can check that out right now. Oh, here's one. Here's a good one. The next story comes out of Arkansas, and I'm almost ashamed of the people of Arkansas for this, but it comes from a campus in Arkansas. So I guess what we know is that despite the fact that Arkansas is a relatively conservative state, you have a university or a campus. And what do we always find on universities and campuses? We find hives of -of out-of-touch liberal people. That's right. Well, according to the story, and it says, campus bans guns, comma, tells people to nod at attackers. And say, if you missed this this week, you're going to say, what? They said, what? Uh, we know up in Colorado, they said, you don't need a gun. You should just vomit or pee on yourself. That's how you defend yourselves against rapists on college campuses in Colorado. Uh, the worst thing that a woman could have when she's facing a rapist is a gun according to the uh, the people up in Colorado. that's just That just perpetuates violence, and we can't allow that. Uh, you don't want to hurt the rapist's feelings. So, I mean, and God in, in heaven, you don't want to shoot a rapist. That would really hurt his feelings. So, But uh, here we go. In uh, uh, what the state of Arkansas did is the Arkansas state legislature approved a concealed carry law that gave school administrators permission to override the concealed carry law and the ban on guns on campus. So essentially what they said is they said, look, if you want to, as an administrator, as a uh, a faculty there, if you want to allow adults to carry concealed on campus, you can do so. And the University of Arkansas said, no, we can't do that. That's bad, 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 bad. And this is the, and this is what they gave, um, <laughs> this is crazy. Sharon Howlett, a detective, with UAL, Department of Public Safety, responded to the threat with advice for avoiding being attacked, which included a suggestion, in quotes, to glance or nod at your possible attacker. Yes, according to Sharon, a glance or a nod will help you show anyone who might think you are not paying attention that you are aware of their presence. Great. Now, this is this is one of those situations where a little bit of knowledge is can be a dangerous thing. If you're a person who carries a concealed firearm, all right, even if you're a person who doesn't, if you go out in public, we've always talked about being aware of your surroundings, you know, not going around with your head up your butt. And that is a good thing. You always want to be aware of your surroundings and you want to be aware of what's going on around you. Okay, great. That's not the only thing you do. You say, uh, there have been uh, many, many instances where people saw their attacker, the attacker saw them, and the attacker decided, okay, there you are. You're my victim. Here we go. And it didn't matter that they saw, uh, let's, let's go ahead to a campus rapist. So the campus rapist sees your daughter walking and she looks at the rapist and he looks at her and he decides, okay, you're good. And he attacks her. 
So that was her, your one and only defense technique is to look at your potential attacker. So what they're telling us here at the University of Arkansas, what the staff is telling us is that you don't need weapons because weapons are bad. All you need to do is look at your attacker or your potential attacker, make eye contact with them and nod and you'll be okay. So it's gone from the ridiculous to the sublime. And we've got Colorado telling uh, young co-eds to just vomit and pee on themselves as a defense against rape. And now we've got uh, the University of Arkansas telling students, you don't need weapons because weapons are bad. What you need is to just look at your attacker and nod at them. Folks, I don't even I don't even know how to address that. Um I know some of you people out there where you're either on the treadmill or you're driving in your car, or you're sitting in your office and you're shaking your head. You're just like, how can, and you know, if it was a 12 year old saying that I could, I could get it, but these are adults. These are supposed to be educated adults. And they're, uh, I would say that these educated adults that are telling people to just that their defense mechanism is mechanism, excuse me is to look at their attacker and nod. I would say that these people have never been victims of rape or robbery or assault. Uh, I, I would say that they've never been the victim of a violent attack. I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, go on record as saying that. A lot of our students of the week or students of the gun or listeners out there have asked or posted questions about home security or personal defense and so forth. And what you may, uh, if you've been paying attention to the show, you'll know that uh, one of the many jobs, one of the many hats that I've worn throughout my life is as a professional bodyguard. And I worked as a professional bodyguard for about 12, 13 years. And when we would defend or we would set up the security on a client's home or when we would do a survey or site survey on a client's home, we essentially went through what we called the four D's and that is deter, detect, delay, and defend. And we're going to break those down for you real quick. Now deter is relatively simple and it's probably the easiest thing for you to do. Probably the most cost effective actually. Deter means Make it make your target look like a hard target or an unattractive target to a bad person, whether it's a burglar, uh, you know, any whatever felon. How do we do that? Well, number one, felons and bad people don't like to get caught in the act. Generally, that's what they don't want to do. They don't want to be caught. They want to be able to do their bad stuff, get away with it and leave. And what do we know? Bad people like to operate in the dark. They like to hide their deeds with the darkness. So the first thing that you can do is make sure that your home is always well lit. Uh, it, I, I, you know, this is funny, but uh, the entire, my entire married life, the entire time that my wife and I have had homes and apartments and what have you, we always leave the lights on at night. And what's ironic to me is how many people get in the habit of when they go to bed at night, walking over to the front and they turn the front porch light off. And all that does, all that signals to does to a bad person or a felon is let them know, aha, the Markles are going to bed right now. I'm watching their house. It's 1030. The front porch light goes out. Okay. So they're going to bed. So now I, you know, I'll wait 30, 40 minutes, wait an hour where they're nice and you know deep asleep, and I'll go steal their car. Well, how much does it cost you to leave your front porch on, porch light on all night long? Pennies, ten cents, fifteen cents worth of electricity, twenty cents maybe. Uh, is twenty cents worth it to have that little extra layer uh, of deterrence at your home? Do not get in the habit of when you're going to bed walking up to the front porch, you know, turning off all the outside lights. So you don't want to do, you want to leave the lights on. Think about it like this. If you were a bad person, if you were a thief, a felon, a burglar, what have you, and you wanted to steal somebody's car out of their driveway and you're driving down the street, which driveway are you going to steal a car out of? You're going to steal a car out of a driveway that's, that's lit up like Christmas, or you're going to steal a car out of a driveway that's dark and will allow you to move around in darkness. Well, obviously, you're going to steal the one from the dark driveway because that's easy or it's more attractive. So 
And also motion lights. Motion lights are great. They're relatively inexpensive to install. And you put them on the, you know, sides of your home and out front, in front of the house, what have you. But uh, light is one of the best things to have. Now, what are the things? Uh, you want to remove any obstacles or, you know, things that, that prevent your house from being seen or from you seeing people as they approach your house. I'm talking about large hedges and so forth. You want to minimize those. You don't want to give bad people good places to hide when they're sneaking around your house looking to steal things from you. You want to minimize those things, not maximize them. So look at the outside of your house. Now, the best time to do this isn't in the middle of the day. It's actually at night. Think about it like this. What I want you to do, if if you're not really sure, if you've never considered this before, set your house up like it normally is at 10 o'clock at night. If you have lights on or lights off or some lights on, some lights off, what have you, go out to the driveway, go out to the street and take a look at your house. Take a look at your own home and think, if I was a bad person trying to sneak up to this house, how could I do it? How could I sneak up to this house without being detected, without being seen? And it's really not that it's not that difficult. And you might find, wow, that was a little easier than, than it should have been. OK, great. Then what do we know? Well, we need to know what we need to trim the hedges down. We need to replace the lights on the outside of the house or put new lights up. We need to do simple, simple things like leaving the outdoor lights on at night when we go to bed. So that's deter. The first D is deter. Make your house or your home look like an unattractive target. Now, that doesn't that doesn't always work. Sometimes they're like, I don't care. That's a good looking house. I want what's in it. Okay, great. Well, the next step in the D's is to detect. That's right. You need to have some type of a warning system that will allow you to know that there are bad people coming up to your house. So first you try and deter them, but they're not deterred and they decide we're going to do it anyway. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can detect. The first thing you're probably thinking about is, well, I'm going to go out and get an ADT security system or, or whatever, electronic security system. Yes, you can do that. Uh, but folks that say, well, I'm, I'm renting a house or I'm renting an apartment, I'm renting, and you have to own the home to put an ADT system in it or what have you. Okay, I got you covered. How about a dog? Dogs, what we, or all what we call four-legged intruder detection systems, free-roaming intruder detection systems. Dogs are fantastic. And even if it's, it doesn't have to be a Rottweiler or an attack shepherd or a pit bull or what have you, even a little annoying Barking wiener dog can hear somebody outside and bark. That, that's, that's really their job. Their job is to alert the human beings. Now you may want a big dog, uh, because, you know, bad people usually don't like being eaten by German shepherds, but, uh, any dog will do in, in a pinch. So, and how about simple things that you can get from Radio Shack? You go to the Radio Shack and you can get wireless driveway alarms. And when the wireless driveway alarm goes off, it goes beep and that high pitch beep. Well, if you've got a dog combined with it, it goes beep and the dogs bark because what do they know? They know somebody just broke the drive alarm and they're, they're coming up the driveway. And so the dogs let you know, Hey, somebody's out there. Fantastic. That's all you need, right? Now you may go the route of, you know, the, the uh, alarm system and that's fantastic too, but you should have some type of a detection system to let you know. The first time sign of trouble shouldn't be when there's a burglar standing, uh, in your doorway. You know, if you wake up and you look and he's standing there, uh, in your bedroom, that's, sh that's not the optimum situation. You don't want him to get that far. Now delay. The next D is delay. Delay essentially means to harden your home, to make it so that someone cannot get inside without using force. Now, any modern home, unless you, you live in, at Fort Knox or your house is designed, you know, like a, uh, like a vault, it can be breached. Windows can be broken. I mean, nobody wants to live in a castle. Nobody wants to live in a vault. Everybody has nice, you know, windows and doors and what have you. And those eventually can be breached. They can be broken with crowbars or baseball bats or, or what have you. But the point is, is they can't do it quietly. They're not going to be able to quietly smash in your front window. They're not going to be able to quietly smash in your front door. They're going to have to make noise to do it. 
And if you t- if you harden up your doors, deadbolts should go at least one inch, if not one and a half inches into the door jam, and the door jam should be reinforced at very minimum. Uh, double pane windows are good, and your polycarbonate windows, the the ones that are shatterproof, not standard glass, they uh, re- you can they're more resistant to let's say sledgehammers, not sledgehammers, but uh, crowbars, baseball bats, and so forth. Harden up your home, make it so that it and it could be just as simple as locking the front door. You the like I said. The first sign that uh, someone has broken into your home shouldn't be when they're standing in your bedroom. Okay. You want them, you want to be aware of it. Give yourself time. You need to have time. Even if you have all the guns and ammunition in the world, it does you no good if you, the first time you realize that there's a rapist in your bedroom is when he's standing over your bed. That's not a good sign. So we, we de- will deter. Make our house look like a poor target. Make want them to go. Make them want to go somewhere else. There's always a, a better target. There's always a bigger fish out there. Detect some type of a detection system, whether it's a dog, whether it's a drive alarm, whether you you know go the full route and get an entire uh, electronic system put into your home. Delay. Harden your home. Lock your doors. Lock your windows. Close the windows. Lock them. Make them force, if they want to get in, make them have to actually force their way in because that gives you time. It gives you time to prepare what is the last one. Defend or defense. When all, if all the previous three have failed or the bad guy just doesn't care, he doesn't care if he's been seen. Okay. He doesn't care if he's been detected. He doesn't care if he's been delayed. He's going to keep smashing on your front door until he gets into the house. Okay. What is the last one? Well, that's obviously defend. And this is where a lot of people screw up. Uh, a lot of, I'm not going to call them sheep, but sheep. This is where they screw up is they like, well, we spend $299 a, a month on the best security system on the planet. Okay. That's great. Well, what happens when the bad guy doesn't care about that, smashes through the uh, the glass decorative door on your back porch, and now he's standing in your kitchen? Well, yeah, but the alarm's going off. Okay. And let's be honest. When an alarm goes off, what is the first thing the alarm company does? Do they dispatch the police immediately? The answer is no. They don't do that. Why don't they? Because there are far more false alarms in the electronic alarm world than there are real alarms. The only time that they dispatch someone immediately is if you hit the designated panic button, and you might have one of those. But if it's just an intruder alarm alarm or a back porch alarm or a motion detector, the first thing they do is not dispatch the police officers. They call the house, right? Wait for you to pick up the phone. And then they ask you for your super secret code word and, you know, they go through that whole rigmarole. Now, if you don't pick up the phone, blah, 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 then they send the police. Okay, great. So let's say you've got the uh, the super awesome best electronic security system on the planet. Guy smashes in the decorative back door. He's standing in your kitchen. The alarm's going off and the uh, alarm company knows. They're like, oh, something's going on. Send the police over to 123 Cherry Maple Lane. All right. How long is it going to take the police to get there? I don't know. How long is it going to take them to get there? It could take them five minutes, which is really quick. It could take them 10 minutes. It could take them 20 minutes. What's going on in the world right now? If you live out in the county or out in the country somewhere and the sheriff's department is the one that's going to be responding to you, it might take a couple of deputies 15 minutes to get to where you are. How much damage can a bad person or several bad people do in 15 minutes? Ask yourself this. If I were to break through my front door, how long would it take me? How long would it take a person who broke through my front door or my back door to get to the master bedroom of my house? You might want to do that just for fun someday. Go to your back door and walk. Count as you walk. Count in your head, 1,001, 1,002, and walk from your back door to your master bedroom. Tell, tell, and then figure out, okay, walking, it took me 27 seconds to get to my master bedroom or 15 seconds. Uh, if the police are five minutes away and it takes them 10 seconds to get from the back door to your bedroom, that's not very much time, is it? 
No, it's not. So the four Ds, you need to deter, you need to detect, you need to delay, and then lastly, you need to be mentally and physically prepared to defend your home. Now, how do you do that? There's lots of different ways, handguns, shotguns, rifles, what have you, but you need to consider that. We don't stop with, I'm just going to buy extra light bulbs, or I'm going to buy a dog, or I'm going to you know, buy a deadbolt or an electronic alarm system. The last line of defense is that defend portion, and you need to be ready to do that. So from you to me, uh, what I would like you to do, if you are a dedicated student of the gun, take a moment to think about the four Ds. Examine your own home. Say, all right, you know, are we lacking in a certain area? And if you are lacking in that area, take a moment to uh, to fix it. it. It's your life that you may be defending or not. So, Now, we always want to make sure that we thank our good friends and our sponsors. We want to thank Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. We want to thank Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. Now, don't forget, we're doing that special Super Tuck giveaway. And to be eligible, all you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com, sign up for our newsletter, and your name will be in the hat to win a free Super Tuck holster. And if you want to check out the Super Tuck holsters and see what they're all about, just go to crossbreedholsters.com and you can check them out. Don't forget our friends at the Firearms Radio Network, our bandwidth sponsors and our good buddies. So you can check them out, check out all the different shows. As a matter of fact, uh, Jared, my uh, studio engineer and my uh, son, Jared was a guest on the Fat to Fit that's right, the Fat to Fit radio show this week, and you can check that out by going to Firearms Radio Network, and you can check them out. So remember, you are a beginner once, but you should be a student for life.